Hey classmate. Um, so as you know, we went to Bradford a few weeks ago and have been asked to make a video about what we might have seen in the museum, about an artifact or a section of the museum, and make a presentation about that or something about the city. If, you've, if you're seeing this, chances are you've asked me about it and I'm sending this back to you because you're one of many people who have asked me. Sorry. But yeah, if you're like me and you're watching this, um, you've probably forgotten what's there. And just like me, who had to make this video, this video is going to jog your memory. <laughs> so yeah, so this this video is going to be about the Science and Museum, yeah, the Science and Media Museum in particular. Um, if you wanted to go anywhere else in the city, unfortunately, this video does not have any information on that. And you're going to have to you know, do your own research on that. So what were we doing in Bradford in the first place? Um, why is the Science and Media Museum even there? And why is something like a media museum not located in something like Manchester or London or even Birmingham, one of the major cities? Well, unlike those bigger cities, those far larger cities, actually, um, Bradford is a UNESCO city of film. This is actually in part due to the wide range of classes, courses and film locations and film relevant industries that are available in the city. And so they also hold industry, well, film specific events each year. So I'm not sure if you went to the, the square in the middle. Well, there they have a um, outdoor film festival, you know, small things like that. That might surprise you because somewhere like somewhere like New York or Hollywood might feel more appropriate. But I guess that kind of shows you how just how special Bradford is. Now, the current theme of the museum is when we went, um, unfortunately it's closed now in my research I found, but it was about the forgotten showman Robert Paul. And the legend goes that this is of the man who invented many of the camera capture techniques that we now know and love and use today. Unfortunately though, this is a man who had a string of mishaps and misfortune and the reason we don't know his name so well other than someone like Kodak is because, well, things like his factory burnt down when the BBC were looking for contracts um, as to who was going to film them, he didn't get it. So we don't know who he is. Now, word on the curb at the Bradford Media Museum is that his very own grandson, um, or Paul's very own grandson, uh, was a curator at the Science and Media Museum until about 10 years ago. So many of the artifacts they have in there and about him are through his uh, relations, um, family artifacts, your know, family heirlooms, stuff like that. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for him, this whole light, I guess, of history of cinema and film would be lost forever there's actually an exhibit dedicated to him on the second floor so if you were looking for more about robert paul you could have gone to the second floor and it takes you through his early you know programmed work and actually british british film early film in general it's actually quite interesting to like, see the features like dedicated to his fight against larger film companies um larger camera manufacturers and you kind of get to see why someone like or a company like kodak is a household name and we have no idea who Robert Paul is. Now, let's actually go through the floors. I'm just gonna go back through the floors and just say what was on each floor. Hopefully it'll jog your memory. So if you've got pictures and films and things like that to look at, you can like, kind of attach to each floor that you were on. But hey, here we go. So on the ground floor, there was an interesting section dedicated to like the history and development of home computing. Um, also the internet actually, funny enough, and social media. It started off with one of the first home computers and the exhibit was like a timeline up until the first or up until home Wi-Fi in 2015, so wire, wireless modem routers, and also social media. I think there's a, a, an art exhibition um, that is dated back to 2017. So it's very it's modern history, very modern history in that regard. Um, there's also more sections in there. However, um, one thing I have been warned about doing is talking about a section I'm going to actually talk about in another piece of graded work. So um, the bit I'm actually going to talk about with Mark is hopefully in that home computing section. So. I'm not going to be talking about that in this video. Now the first floor we can kind of ignore because it was reserved for school children um, and they were playing with mud or something, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what kids do these days. So yeah, ignore the first floor. Second floor we've already spoken about is about Robert Paul. The third floor is pretty cool. We had this experience TV section um, which had elements of like mid 2000s advertising. So we're here we got to see like, the trend of, at least here in the UK and more generally in Europe and a little bit of America or North America or United States. Um, we got to see like, the trend of adverts which have nothing to do with the product that they represent and this also gave us like a history of modern history television 
Now, what I thought was quite interesting is I looked at like, things like soaps, um, it looked at comedy, well, soaps from the 80s, comedies in the 90s, and game shows in the 2000s. So if we look back at exhibit, um, and actually, if you remember, there was a section right at the back, it's tiny little like enclave kind of thing. Um, it was where they had like the super dark moments in, in television history. So, yeah, so we had, yeah, we had things like the Challenger 2 disaster, which is pretty drastic. You know, that's like a moment where children gathered around at the TV, watched a rocket go up, they had a teacher on it and it exploded. That's super dark. We're talking about like Princess Diana's funeral was on it. Um, they had bits of the planes hitting nine, the, thousand, the twin towers 9-11. It was dark, okay? So um, if you didn't go in there or you don't really want to remember or talk about it, that was what was in there. Now, directly opposite, also on the third floor, was the Wonder Lab. Now, I'm not too sure if the Wonder Lab, Wonder Lab is anything relevant to this course, but um, I went in there and took some fun selfies. It was mainly the science section of the science museum, if you understand what I'm getting. So it was about talking about light, how light is you know, played with, looked at prisms, looked at UV light and um, yeah, random stuff. But if you have, if you want to talk about the Wonder Lab, I hope you have footage because I just went in there and took selfies. So yeah, long story short, it had lots of stuff that like played with like light and color and also sound actually, funnily enough. And yeah, it was rammed with kids all day. So also I don't have a lot of footage in there of other children, cause you know, there are laws against that kind of thing, but it was super trippy. So yeah, um, ch the children love it. The kiddos loved it. Now uh, it's got one more floor. That was also something else for the kiddos. Um, so nothing really to report there. I think it was like their lunch, their dedicated lunch area. So I have no, no footage of that. Um, the fifth floor now, fifth floor. Yes, that was where arguably the best bit of the whole museum was there. Um, it was a history of video games. Now, I know, I know some people are already going to do sections on video games, so hopefully this little bit I'm about to talk about is going to be helpful for you. Um, but this feature, this exhibition, looked at both home and arcade video game systems. It took you through like ho iconic home video entertainment systems and consoles, such as the Apple II, if you were playing Prince of Persia. But if you're looking at it as a game, it's quite interesting because the game gives you unlimited number of lives but it's on a timer so the actual sequence of the game and the game's ending changes so as like a piece of game narration that is quite key um as to like you can get a different ending depending on how quickly you got through the game and then next it was the ps1 and actual soccer now this game was from 95 96 and i say 95 96 because it depends on where the game was released and where you want to look at it and how the game was released because of um, region locking, so the game's a little bit different depending on where you played it and where the game was picked up from. Controls are super janky um, because you can actually do 45 degrees of rotation. So this is now like history time. When I was younger, sometimes it was quicker if you want to get a more accurate input to like if you're going this way, you want to go there. Sometimes it's more accurate to like go around in the circle like counterclockwise, and then um, you'd end up with a more accurate position. But you can look at that, something like that. And actually, got, it was like so iconic as a awkward bit of m movement that the um, PS2 and PS3 actually celebrated how many degrees of <laughs> how many degrees of input you could put in to move a character and make it more accurate. So um, yeah, you can look at that PS1 and development of the games console if you wanted. Um, but also speaking of like janky controllers, um, there was also an Atari 26 or Atari 2600 or 2600, depending on um, how you want to say it. I like the 2600. Um, sounds a little bit easier on the ear. Um, that had a game of Pong, so one of the earliest, earliest video games that you could play at home. Um, if you wanted to get a good game out of that, good luck. Only one of the controllers worked. So I think in my footage, there's, there's a game that someone's getting whooped like 11 nil because one of the controllers doesn't work. But yeah, you can look into that. There was also next to it um, a ZX Spectrum 48K and a Super Nintendo and also a Sega Mega Drive. Mega Drive playing Sonic and then the Super Nintendo playing Mario Kart. Next to that was the, arguably the greatest games console of all time. The Nintendo 64 playing none other than GoldenEye. 007, yeah, one of the greats. Now, if, you weren't, if you're not interested in home computing or home video game consoles and shooting your friends with golden guns, there was, the exhibition did have and did feature arcade cabinets. So let's start with what they call like the arcade coffee tables. Um, there was like the original Donkey Kong with you like throw barriers at Barrios, <laughs> barrels at Mario and Pac-Man. There were some other other games um, I'm trying to think of now. But that's what I can remember. I think there was like three tables. I think two of them were the same and one of them was Pac-Man. 
Now, cabinets, oh, okay, cabinets, that's what, cabinets, that's where the real fun was at, okay? It's a street, there was Street Fighter 2, as well as like newer cabinets that had people like with shooters and you to shoot barrels. That was super fun. And like really early arcade or mid 90s arcade light shooter games. So yeah, you can look at that as a technology if you wanted. Um, There's also a cabinet that featured solely independent like young developers. So it was like a cabinet, it was one of the newer ones in the corner. On it was like, a hundred games, something like that. It was ridiculous. And all of them were made by like children at school. Like let's not go into like sweatshop and slave labor a little bit, but yeah, the children made their own games. So very early developers, um, kind of showing you that anyone could get into game development these days. Um, I think the one that I've, I've got playing is that I'm trying to catch these fish that jump up randomly from the bottom and I'm just trying to move my fisherman to catch the fish. Super simple games like that, um, really fun. And yeah, all these games are like loaded onto one cabinet. So if so, depending on what you were playing on that cabinet, it could be very different. But that cabinet was the same. If you go across that floor on the same floor on the fifth floor, you're up to a section dedicated on animation. Now, I thought this was a personally very interesting space because you got to look at both drawn and digital animation. So both hand drawn and computer animation. Um, if that doesn't look at hybridity, I don't know what does. And yeah, it looks like it goes from like stop motion, so when people are taking pictures of each frame, to more fluid computer dynamics and computer animations and um, computer graphics, I should, I should really say. So you kind of get to watch the form evolve through like this mini history. And it was very interesting because you get to see animators and cinematographers work out the kinks of the art form. So you've gone from like static images with like a static background to you watching people um, have multiple sets or using digital backgrounds on physical animations or, op or opposite way around where they superimpose a digital image onto a physical background. So um, there's also actually, there's also a section that, that allowed you to have a go. So I think I had a go on camera of me trying to um, move the drawn, the many drawn frames that I need to do a turn handle. Don't know why I'm doing that anyway. Uh, Harry Potter. But um, yeah, there was a f small frame and you got to move the move the man ever so slightly. You just go boop, 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 and you can move the background separately. And then you captured them all as a stop motion and it played back for you as a one second loop. It was a lot of work um, and I'm holding the camera so it doesn't look very good, but I promise you I've got a good, I've got a good one in there eventually, okay? What was next? And, oh yes, the last floor, the sixth floor, that was the BFI Media Suite. Now, I don't know everyone went onto it, but honestly, it was, I think it was one of the most insightful sections of the whole museum. So the BFI Suite or the British Film Institute Suite, if you went right to the top, you could go to, up to the desk and say, hey, I want X number of minutes. I think that was for 20 minutes. And you'd get a booth, you go into the booth and you could watch anything the BFI has ever released from my understanding, at least that's how it was advertised to me. Um, again, in 20 minutes, I was not going to watch their entire media catalog, but what I did watch was, um, a video about, or a documentary more accurately, on the Bradford riots. It was free as well, so you don't, you don't have to worry about paying for it. If you ever go back there, if you feel like you have the, the means and the time, actually it's closed, never mind. I was gonna say, if you wanna go back there in, in the few days you've got left before this is dead, before this deadline is due in, you could, but you can't because it's closed. So yeah, if it ever opens again, consider that a tip. Now that's six floors, and I think about six exhibits, but there was a secret seventh floor and seventh exhibit, if you do remember. Now, if you could, if you went down to the bottom floor, the negative one, the basement, there was um, an, an only available via booking Kodak gallery. Now, it was behind a locked door, it was behind a, you know, a, an access point, but if you took your time and before your behind the scenes tour and you just wandered around a little bit, you would have seen some really interesting stuff. Now, I didn't know that until obviously I got behind there and that was the last group of the day. Kind of did a speed run for it, so not not a lot of footage here. But what I did see, and if I check my notes again, um, yeah, you would have seen things like the Kodak Brothers uh, and their early inventions. You would have seen how they developed the camera and their camera capture techniques and um, lithography, I believe it's called, techniques. Um, you would have also seen how they Oh yeah, how you would have seen their iconic products and how they marketed them. So things like, um, oh well, sorry, we're talking about that from the 60s, I saw anyway. So it might have been from earlier on, but like, yeah, you could have seen things like the gold uh, Max Coda Color, one of my favorite pieces of, of film ever. Um, and yeah, if I had the time, I'd go into that. In fact, I might do that as another one, just as a side thing during the holidays, who knows. Now the tours themselves, um, I understand that we all saw different things, yes. So if you saw me on Instagram and what I posted, 
it was met with controversy that we did not all see the same things. So what did I see? The Daily Herald archive. So yeah, there's lines of cabinets, there's loads of stuff in there. Like three million pictures are in there. So, or photographs, I should say, not just pictures. But yeah, we also saw something different. So I think in the group that I was in, there's about 15 of us and yeah, the filming isn't great, but you're gonna see what I did capture. Next up was the television and film archive. Um, here we got to see some of the artifacts that the grandson I spoke about earlier brought into the museum and like yeah, hooked them up with. A lot of the things are super exclusive. You're never gonna see them before and they are one of a kind. May never actually be shown to the public because of how sensitive they are. And as such, what you're gonna see is a lot of things that are a sign of the times. You're gonna see things that are like Sputnik looking television sets um, and a 1960s live yeah, live television camera and it's capture box or I, I forgot what the, the transmitter I think they called it. Lastly, the last thing I saw was the light room or the low light room. So in here, we saw things that some of the archivists will never see. Um, they were chemically composed, chemical compositions. I'm not sure what the right word is for these kind of delicate artifacts because again, I didn't see them and we weren't really told too much about them. But what we did see were very, very, very early captured images i'm going to say i'm going to use them i don't know if the word photograph is accurate but like sheets of metal sheets and we saw chemicals placed on them or what we were told chemicals were placed on them so like arsenic was on them apparently yeah honestly these things are very very delicate so i had to put like i put i had to, like, I had to have a tripod and i like, put it down so like no one was going to touch anything here so sorry about the things kind of like just drifting above the view but yeah there were things of like movie props as well so we had um, eyeballs from early cinema. We also had fake teeth from like the first Dracula movie with Christopher Lee, and the empty blood, squirrely squirrely sachet in there as well. So that's everything from me. Hopefully, it jogged your memory sufficiently, and um, this video was helpful as I'd like to think it was. So yeah, look forward to seeing your presentations. Oh wait, I'm not going to see them, am I? Because we're not going to be in to see them. So yeah, I hope your presentation goes well. And um, I'll continue to do the readings each week. So yeah, keep an eye out for that and consider this revision session over.